will begin by saying that I have no commercial interests or conflicts to declare, and the research that I will present on human embryos has been performed with full ethical approval and informed patient consent according to our HFVA research license number 0067. <clears throat> and the research approach that we take in my laboratory is to attack this from a multi-species angle. We work on pig and cow embryos. We don't work on mouse embryos traditionally. <coughs> pig and cow together provide quite an interesting and appropriate model for human embryos. And it means that we can carry out reductive science. We can ask questions on the pig and the cow. We can apply our knowledge and our learning to the spare human embryos that we get from research. And for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to consider these four points. Firstly, I'm going to give a very brief reminder of what metabolism is, just to set the scene for the talk. I'll then answer the question, or give an answer to the question, of why we measure this in the embryo. And I'll present th briefly three studies highlighting the importance of metabolism. And I'll finish off with some closing thoughts. So what is metabolism? It's not a series of pathways from one place to the other. It's significantly more complicated. <laughs> metabolism is complex. When we're studying metabolism, we are studying diverse chemical and structural compounds. So for instance, if we look at molecular biology, we are looking at one compound, deoxyribonucleic acid. We can amplify it, we can detect it. With metabolites, we are talking about small molecules. They can differ in enormously in abundance. There can be many orders of magnitude difference in terms of concentration of small molecules. But metabolism is essential <laughs> for cellular function. None of this occurs, genome to transcriptome to proteome to metabolome, without the provision of energy, without the provision of ATP. And when we measure energy metabolism, we're essentially getting a snapshot of physiology at a fixed point in time. So why measure it? <clears throat> well, of course, there's the question of interest. The British developmental biologist Lewis Wolpert said that one of the great challenges was, the, or one of the great drivers for embryo research was the desire to understand the beginnings of the self. That in itself is a noble pursuit. It's interesting. <coughs> and from that interest point of view, there's been a number of studies carried out on the metabolic life course of the embryo. How does the early pre-implantation embryo generate its energy from zygote to blastocyst? I'm sure everyone in this audience knows the developmental trajectory of a, of a pre-implantation embryo, from the zygote through cleavage to forming the blastocyst. There's a lot going on during this period of development, an enormous amount of development going on. We have the combination of genetic material, the rapid increase in cell number, but without any growth. Cell number grow gets bigger, but the embryo stays the same size. At the morula, we see the formation of the cell-to-cell -cell junctions to enable cellular communication. And then at the blastocyst, this beautiful structure of which many of us are obsessed with, we see cellular differentiation. We start to see protein synthesis true growth. The formation of this cavity, this blastocell cavity, <coughs> requires an enzyme called sodium potassium ATPase. The clue is in the name. That requires enormous amounts of ATP. What is important to remember is that the mitochondrial number, as best that we know, is fixed during this period. So the, the embryo has to adapt its metabolic needs with what's provided when it was a zygote. And when we measure embryo metabolism, certainly in, in my laboratory, we tend to adopt a non-invasive approach. We put our embryo in a droplet of culture media, we leave it for a defined period of time, <coughs> and we look at the depletion of compounds of interest, pyruvate. I, I, I may have to authenticate, apologies. Pyruvate, lactate, glucose. And we look at the appearance of compounds too. But the clearest indication of metabolism of an embryo is that change in culture media if you use indicator in your culture media. Phenol red going slightly yellow as we culture cells, that's metabolism, that's the production of lactate. Most metabolic studies do not study pathways specifically. They do not study metabolic flux or interaction. What we generally are studying 
is the disappearance of a compound, the appearance of a, a metabolite, and we're doing our best to fill in the gap in between using knowledge that we have of biochemical pathways. And using this approach, we've been able to describe with some accuracy the metabolic life course of a pre-implantation embryo. These are just, this is data from laboratories that I've been involved with, but other people have published this idea that the, blast, the embryo is metabolically fairly quiet, quiescent during the cleavage stages. It's not doing much. But it consumes, this is a mouse, it consumes pyruvate. It takes pyruvate from the culture media. The same is true for the cow and the human. The pig is slightly complicated because we don't tend to put pyruvate in the medium. At the blastocyst stage, in every species study, we see a characteristic increase in glucose consumption and a characteristic increase in lactic acid production, leading to the conclusion that blastocysts become glycolytic. And we can summarise the, the, the metabolic life course of an embryo. Pyruvate appears to be the central energy substrate in those species studied. During the first day or two, glycolysis is fairly low. And the Krebs cycle, oxidative metabolism, is the dominant pathway. The embryo goes from a relatively inactive metabolic tissue to a rapidly metabolising tissue. That was written in 1973 by Ralph Brinster. And everything we've done since then has essentially confirmed this early description. <clears throat> One thing that I would just mention, though, is that we are now becoming increasingly aware of fat or triglyceride in the early embryo and the important role <coughs> that plays in development. So if we take an overview of, of ATP production, this is an estimation of total ATP production from aerobic or oxidative processes and anaerobic processes. This is from a pig, but this pattern could be seen from any, any mammalian species. ATP production is fairly low, stable, during the cleavage stages, before a sharp increase in oxygen consumption. So you may ask, why do we continue to ask these questions? Ralph Brinster defined this in 1973. Well, we've recently learned, for example, that not all oxygen consumed by embryos is used productively. <coughs> a PhD student of mine using new technology has recently identified that only 66% of oxygen consumed by an embryo is used for generating ATP. 20% of it is consumed by mitochondria but not used for generating ATP at all. 12% of oxygen consumption is not used by the mitochondria in any way. It's used for non-mitochondrial purposes. And really interestingly, the embryo has an ability to increase its oxygen consumption to satisfy demand should it change. It, an embryo has the capacity to almost double its oxidative capacity should it need. And what this really highlights is this, this allows us to look at the, the plasticity of embryo metabolism, but also illustrates the self-correcting nature of science. As we develop more, more knowledge, we are able to reanalyze and reinterpret older data. Of course, embryo metabolism has, is generally viewed with this question of a biomarker of viability. And in 2002, Francesca Houghton, working with Henry Lees in York, identified that embryos that, day two embryos that went on to give, give a blastocyst had a different amino acid profile, a profile of production and consumption of amino acids, compared to those embryos that arrested. Two years later, Daniel Bryson carried out a small-scale clinical trial where he found that day one to two amino acid metabolism was predictive of clinical pregnancy. And three years after that, Paula Stokes demonstrated that amino acid metabolism could predict between grade one embryos, cryopreserved embryos, between those that would give a pregnancy and those that would not. Subsequently, there's a number of groups have looked at amino acid metabolism. Helen Picton <coughs> notably demonstrated that Embryos that have levels of aneuploidy have a different metabolic profile to those embryos that do not. And there have been a number of publications looking at or identifying this idea of embryo metabolism as a marker of viability. David Gardner most recently has, from uh, Melbourne has published data looking at glucose consumption of single embryos claiming it to be predictive of embryo sex and live birth outcome. And just this year, just in June, a Brazilian group identified that non-invasive prediction of blastocyst formation. I am sorry about this. <laughs> 
Um, by it, this group claimed that it was possible to carry out lipid fingerprinting to identify embryos of high viability. There was only one problem with this. In probably the only, I think this was a randomised trial, there is no evidence that embryo selection using near-infrared spectroscopy, metabolomics, was able to improve live birth rates. So this work essentially was largely halted. It's unfortunate, though, because I do genuinely believe that metabolism can tell us a lot about the life course of an embryo. So why do I believe that? What is the importance of metabolism? I'm going to give a case study, as I say, with three small studies that we've been involved in to answer this question of does metabolism program development? We consider the flow of information from the genome to the proteome to the metabolome, but I believe that the flow of information goes the other way as well. And this work has been carried out mostly by Vila van Huck, who is a visiting PhD student from Antwerp, and my own two PhD students, Christine Leary and Paul McKeegan. So the first study is a bovine study. And what we did here was we took other sites <coughs> and we exposed them to elevated levels of non-esterified fatty acids. Those levels were physiologically relevant, determined from the follicle. We then fertilized the oocytes, cultured the embryos in standard embryo culture media, and looked at a number of important endpoints. The first thing that we observed was that embryos that had come from eggs exposed to high levels of steric acid, or steric, oleic, oleic, and palmitic acid, had a lower cell number and higher levels of apoptosis. Now, just to reiterate, the intervention was at the egg, and this is carrying over into the blastocyst. We saw that the amino acid profile, which I still believe is an indicator of viability, was different. Embryos coming from eggs exposed to high levels of non-esterified fatty acids had increased amino acid consumption and increased amino acid turnover. When we looked at the... I apologise, this is so small. But when we looked at the metabolic strategy, we saw that embryos from eggs exposed to high levels of fat had a reduced oxygen consumption at the blastocyst stage and notably, this figure here shows that these embryos do not consume glucose. <coughs> the idea of a blastocyst not consuming glucose is quite a, quite a startling one. We looked at the gene expression of these blastocysts, and we saw increased expression of genes related to de novo methylation. We saw increased expression of insulin-like growth factor 2 receptor. And really interestingly, we saw increased expression of the gene SLC2A1 which in English is glucose transporter. So we have these embryos exposed to high levels of fat, not consuming glucose, but increasing their expression of glucose transporter. Other genes were increased in expression. Genes related to fatty acid synthesis, mitochondrial biogenesis, and protection against reactive oxygen species. Well, that's all well and good, but you guys are interested in human embryo metabolism. We've recently published a study where we've looked at the and the effect of being overweight and obese on embryo physiology. The model is similar. The follicle differences, are, uh, the differences that we have observed come from the, the egg. Oocytes were collected from women who were overweight and obese or who were of healthy body weight. Fertilization and culture environment was not different, and we observed differences in the blastocyst. The first thing that we observed was that oocytes from overweight and obese ladies are smaller. Smaller oocytes are significantly less likely to form a blastocyst. And when we compared the morphokinetics, the timing of development, we saw that embryos coming from overweight and obese ladies developed faster. On average, they reached the moral stage some 17 hours sooner than embryos from normal, healthy white women. When we look at the metabolism, we observed that embryos, blastocysts from women, from overweight women's eggs, contain significantly more fat. Their embryos are fatter. They consume significantly less glucose. So there is a real change in the metabolic profile of these embryos just because the woman was overweight. And we saw differences in cell counts and a reduction in trophectoderm number in the embryos collected from women who were overweight and obese. This just summarizes this. We have now replicated this in three independent studies using over 900 human embryos, all donated to research. And we've also been able to verify that this is independent of the male. 
What does this matter? Well, we know from our own study, and others have published, that the birth weight of embryos, birth weight of children from overweight and obese women, is increased significantly in our case. And quite excitingly, and this is just very early data, it does appear that we may be able to alter the embryo culture media to restore the metabolic profile of these embryos, which opens up the question of specific um, personalised embryo culture media dependent on the physiology of the woman. So the conclusion, we have a metabolic insult here at the egg, no metabolic insult in our experiments during cleavage stage, and we see changes in development. How does this occur? <clears throat> well, of course, we're going to hit, hopefully hear a fantastic talk today by Fun Chu Tang about the DNA methylation landscape of the human embryo. The human embryo, while it's, or all embryos, while they are developing, undergo intense genome remodeling. They go from two highly specialized cells, the egg and the sperm, to completely undifferentiated cells and then re-begin the process of differentiation. All the genome marks, or almost all of the genome marks, the epigenetic marks, are removed. And this represents a period of great sensitivity and great susceptibility in the embryo. Um, it's becoming increasingly aware that metabolism can influence epigenetics. Think about histone acetylation, a an epigenetic modification. The word acetylation requires acetyl-CoA, a metabolic substrate. This is leading many of us to ask the question of, does the availability of substrates impact these processes? For the last few minutes of my talk, I'll just mention one last study that we've done to try and begin to answer this question. Again, this is cattle, and here what we have done is we have, we have played with metabolism. The specific Intervention really isn't important for this process, but what we have done is inhibited fatty acid metabolism or activated fatty acid metabolism prior to genome activation. We have then looked at the metabolism of the <coughs> resulting blastocysts and compared the transcriptome and the epigenome using the embryo gene platform that Mark andre Sirard runs in Canada. So the first thing that we have done when we've activated, sorry, activated fatty acid metabolism we can see that we've reduced the amount of fat in the embryo because they've consumed it. When we've inhibited fatty acid oxidation, we can see the embryos contain more fat. They haven't been able to metabolize it. So this indicates our inhibitors are working as we would expect. And we've detected a difference in oxygen consumption. When we look at the transcriptomic differences of these embryos, these volcano plots indicate differential genes that are, genes that are differentially expressed. In this region, we see genes that are overexpressed in the controls or expression is reduced in our intervention. And in this area, we see genes that are overexpressed in our intervention. Just by inhibiting fatty acid oxidation prior to genome activation, we see 440 genes that are differentially expressed in the embryos. If we activate, stimulate fatty acid oxidation, we see 152 genes differentially expressed. <clears throat> These dots are kind of impersonal. What do those genes relate to? Well, if we stimulate fatty acid oxidation, this isn't all of them. This is a, a select panel. We see downregulation of a number of genes related to metabolism, obesity. I've highlighted these genes here, interferon tau specifically. That's a key gene in pregnancy recognition in cattle, the expression of which is downregulated in embryos where we have stimulated fatty acid oxidation prior to genome activation. When we inhibit fatty acid oxidation, there's a number of important genes that, or genes related to important processes that are downregulated. Genes related to wind signaling, amino acid metabolism, mitochondrial function, electron transport, post-translational modifications. So this here is illustrating the point that we've changed metabolism and we see the consequence in the genome. In terms of epigenetic changes, well, this is a minefield, I'm afraid. Two and a half thousand differentially methylated regions when we inhibit fatty acid oxidation and over 1,400 differentially methylated regions when we stimulate fatty acid oxidation. We're still going through this data, but just to, again, to illustrate the point that a change in metabolism influences the epigenetics of the embryo. And this is important because we are becoming more and more aware of the fact that alterations in maternal nutrition and in vitro culture 
acting through the blastocyst can have potential programming effects, possibly leading to long-term health, adverse health outcomes. So I'm coming to the end of my talk, you'll be pleased to hear. Let's consider what the easiest way is to change embryo metabolism. The easiest way is to take it out of its natural environment. When we perform IVF, we bypass the oviduct. We are culturing an embryo in an in vitro environment. We are incredibly fortunate that the embryo is permissive. It allows us to do this. Many cells would not put up with what we do with it. We cultured the embryos in an environment that is imperfect. It's as good as we can achieve, based on the best of our knowledge. But we know very much that the profile of, or the provision of many substrates differs in our IVF medium compared to the oviduct. And just the very process of removing an embryo from the oviduct influences the metabolism. 25 years ago, working in York, David Gardner demonstrated this most elegantly, where he took mouse embryos, in vivo derived, flushed them from the oviduct, and within three hours of being in culture, their oxygen, their glycolysis, glycolytic rate, had increased from around 20% to over 70%. So changes in met metabolism is incredibly sensitive to the environment in which the embryo is kept. And I believe that our data is starting to identify that metabolism changes the physiology of the embryo. So let's just change the medium. Well, we're, again, we're now becoming more and more aware of the impact of embryo culture medium and how that can alter the offspring. In work from John de Moulin, published five years ago now, a comparison of two commercially available culture media in IVF clinics identified a difference in birth weight of babies dependent on whether the embryos had been cultured in vitro life or cooked medium. Just this summer, uh, Sander Kleek has published Differences, differences in gene expression of embryos dependent on whether they've been grown in cook or um, vitro life medium. And I've highlighted here a couple of favourite genes or families, differences in nuclear receptors and lipid metabolism and differences in genes related to oxygen metabolism, oxidative phosphorylation. So this leads me to my closing thoughts. We should be mindful of what we're doing with the embryo, but we must work with it to understand what we are doing. We're becoming aware that dysregulated metabolism during these early stages can change metabolism in the blastocyst. What we don't know now is how this impacts onto the fetus, onto the offspring, and how this propagates. These questions are vital. They're vital almost for long-term health of the offspring. We need to carry out this research. So to summarise, I hope I've explained to you that metabolism is a broad term. It refers, refers to the processes that provide the fuel for everything. We've got a very good picture of embryo metabolism, but that picture is evolving. It's changing as we have new and better technologies. Embryo metabolism is dynamic, it's flexible, it's responsive, but we should be aware of the changes that we enforce on an embryo and what the consequences of those may be because it's becoming increasingly aware that little changes, insignificant choices, potentially could have a big impact on epigenetics, signalling, and possibly lifelong health. And with that, I'd like to thank the people that have done the work, specifically Christine Leary, Paul McKeegan, also um, Fabrice Gariff, uh, Verla Van Hook, my collaborators Henry Lees, Daniel Bryson in Manchester, Joe Leroy in Antwerp, Marc-Andre Sirard, my funders, who generously let us do this work, and very specifically, the abattoir who provide us with our material and the staff and patients at the whole IVF unit who do all the work in terms of collecting the embryos for us. Thank you very much.